Well, if you'll turn again this morning to Romans chapter 1 as we continue to look at where America is in prophecy today. Let me begin reading with verse 18 down through verse 23. Romans chapter 1 beginning with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, and that's a present tense verb, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. Again, we just sort of sleepwalk through life down here. We never take uh, time to contemplate the fact that we're only here for a short moment of time, and then we're going to be in eternity somewhere, either with God or away from God. And the times that you and I are part of are enough to make us seriously consider that. So Paul is saying not only to the Roman church, but to all of us this morning, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through that which has been made, so that they are without excuse. You understand there's not a person on the face of this earth that will ever stand before God and say, I have an excuse. I don't care if you live in the darkest regions of a jungle. This is what he's saying here. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So I want to ask all of us again this morning, how did we get to where we are right now? And maybe that doesn't concern you, where we are in America at this point. And certainly the Word of God is not silent in answering that question. Paul tells us, beginning in the 18th verse of the first chapter, all the way down through verse 32, and I'll get through those other verses, why have we allowed this to happen? What has caused this? Does God abandon a nation? As one prophecy writer put it, America is hemorrhaging from within. The Huns and the Vandals of moral rot are upon us. Another Bible scholar asked this question. Within recent years, conditions within the country and criticism from without have raised the serious question of the continual greatness of this nation. Can this nation long endure with such crime and lawlessness and anarchy threatening from within? Is the nation approaching dangerously near the point that other great nations reached before they disintegrated and disappeared? And I can tell you tonight, this morning, folks, history is filled with the wreckage of great nations that rose to unusual power and position, and you don't find them anymore because of the internal moral rot. They collapsed under the weight of their own corruption. Their compromise and divine judgment fell upon them. And we don't like to think about that. I understand that. As one writer put it again, but one could argue that America has squandered its birthright and that judgment is long only due. It is only by the mercy and long suffering of God that we have been spared this long. And he's given us a clear picture, not only in the verses I read, but all the way down through verse 32. So I want to remind you again what I said last week, and we put it this all together. Paul has made it very, and when we come to the book of Romans, the theme of it 
is the righteousness of Almighty God. And there's not a person in this room this morning, folks, that will ever have a right standing before God apart from His condition. So, Paul brings the entire world into a divine courtroom and the judge up there is not one that's going to be preferential. He's not going to rule out of his own bias and his own opinions. He's the sovereign, omniscient, almighty God of this universe. We're brought into the courtroom and we stand before the judge of all the earth. And Paul makes it very clear that the righteousness of God That which God requires of every individual for eternal life, all of that has been revealed. And it has been revealed through what we're studying in Sunday school, the gospel. And we went through that last week. Five times in this first chapter, Paul talks about the gospel. And before you get to verse 18, he makes it very clear, the gospel has been revealed. God has clearly revealed the gospel. And that gospel is in the God-man Jesus Christ. We're without excuse because there it is. God has put him against the horizon of the sky and said, this is my beloved son. And the only way you will ever get into heaven is through him. Only when the righteousness of Jesus has been imputed unto you, put to your account, will you be able to stand before a holy, righteous God? And that's why Paul said in verses 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of that gospel. I gladly proclaim it, for it is the power of God. And that ought to excite every one of us, folks. I'm not responsible for people being saved. I am responsible for communicating the gospel. And within the gospel, there is the almighty, omnipotent power of God. It will do its work when we share it. I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So God has revealed that. Let me make this contrast very clear to us. We're without excuse. And Paul is going to get a little bit more specific. He revealed the gospel in the living word Jesus. He's given us the gospel in the written word scripture. And now suddenly in verse 18, he begins a transition. Not only has the gospel of God been revealed, but the wrath. And understand that's a word we don't like to to, uh, talk about today. The wrath of God has been revealed revealed. Wow. These are present tense verbs. That means they are continually being revealed. And we've all talked about this last Sunday, long before Jesus was born. God had promised the gospel. He had predicted that the Messiah would come. And when the Messiah would come, he would bear the sins of the whole world in his body on the cross. And now he is declaring to you and me that the wrath of God has now been revealed. What what in the world does that mean? How is that being revealed? Some theologians say we're now under the, the passive wrath of God. So let me see if I can illustrate that for us so we can understand why none of us will ever stand in the presence of God apart from the finished work of Jesus on the cross. The wrath of God has been revealed revealed. What does that mean? I'll see if I can. So here in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, the instructions were very clear. You can eat of every tree in the garden freely. God prepared the earth for humanity to inhabit it, folks. It was made for Adam and Eve to live in a perfect environment, to have a perfect relationship with God. They were created guiltless and they were created in innocence. But he also gave them a free will. And now he is giving them a positive command. You can eat of every tree in the garden that's there and you can eat freely. But the negative one is there is one tree you are not to eat from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the consequences 
are very, very emphatic. The day that you eat of it, you will surely die. I don't, that's not hard to understand. What they probably didn't understand was the nature of that death to begin with. Maybe they were thinking about physical death. But that's not what happened when they disobeyed God first. By an act of their own will, and they knew better, and, and I'm not going through Genesis with you this morning, Adam was there. He knew what God had said. He was the head of that household. But Satan came to the woman, and when he tempted her, she thought that everything looked beautiful. Maybe God is holding out on us. And Satan said, well, he knows if you eat of that tree, you'll be like him. And what a foolish, foolish statement that is. They were already created in the image of God, folks. And the moment they reached out, and I want you to understand this morning, they didn't do some vile, depraved, immoral act. They simply disobeyed the Word of God. You know what God is saying to you today? Do you deliberately disobey that Word? And the moment they did, they died. Wow. Wow. Well, wait a minute, Adam was 930 years old before he died physically, I know that. But that wasn't the first consequence. The first consequence was spiritual death. And it's hard for us to comprehend if we don't take the time to understand what God had done in Genesis. God's first sanctuary on the face of the earth was a man's body, Adam and Eve. And sometimes we, we get the wrong conception about death. The word death in the Bible just simply means separation, both the Old and the New Testament. Adam and Eve were indwelt by a holy God. They had a relationship with their Creator. They had fellowship with Him every day. And now the moment they disobeyed God, God left them went back into eternity. Please get this straight in your thinking, folks. This is why so many people never understand the gospel, never understand what it means to be saved. Where there had been light and life in Adam and Eve's spirit, there was now death and darkness. God separated away from them. They immediately died spiritually. God wasn't in them. And the result of that one man's sin, according to Romans oh, in chapter 5, death has passed to the whole human race. That means that every little baby that is conceived in a mother's womb is conceived with a sin nature. Oh, that precious, yes. Yes. You don't have to teach children to throw temper tantrums and to cry and to rebel. You don't have to teach them that. They do that naturally because of that sin nature. Sin separates us from God. Now, now, I'm not going through this whole thing with you. At that moment, listen to me very carefully, the wrath of God, and that word wrath in both the Old and the New Testament does not indicate some rash, emotional expression of anger and bitterness. The word wrath means the settled displeasure of God against sin. Sin is opposite of His holiness, His purity, His righteousness. Sin never exists in the presence of God. And the moment they sinned, the wrath of God now was poured... Now, let me put it another way now settled upon all of them. They were under God's wrath because of sin. Disobedience to God. And without going through the whole thing of Genesis, that wrath from that moment 
up until now abides on the whole human race. I, I'm trying to make this as clear as I know how to make it because we don't consider that. We all are under the wrath of God. All of us. Without exception. That is God's settled displeasure against sin. He hates sin. And we don't seem to understand what that means in our lives and our lifestyle. The whole of humanity from the beginning is bankrupt spiritually. We are in need of forgiveness and pardon. And now Paul is bringing the whole world into God's courtroom and saying, the wrath of God abides on you. And he's using a present tense, and this is why I went back to Genesis. The wrath of God is being revealed, and that word revealed is, is, the, is the title of the life's book of the New Testament, Revelation. His wrath, His deep-seating, abiding anger against sin because God is holy. He is just. Boy, we don't see ourselves like that. If we ever saw ourselves like that in the presence of a holy God, our reaction would be that of the Old Testament saints and the New Testament. We'd be on our face in the dirt. Depart from me because I am a wicked man. And I want you to understand this morning, folks. This is what happened. That wrath here in the Garden of Eden It abides and still abides from that moment until right now. Any man, a woman, boy or girl, apart from the Lord Jesus is under the wrath of God. All of us are still under that wrath, but there, if we've come to faith in Jesus, there's a, another consequence. I'll get to that. In John chapter 3, verse 36, this is what John writes. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. One of the things that distresses me about these new songs that started 20 or 30 years ago, we always concentrate on just the attribute of love. We never talk about the holiness of God. But His holiness describes all of the attributes. His love is holy love. The wrath of God abides on that person. Paul conclusively proves that God is justifiably angry with humanity and all people stand condemned under His judgment. You need to understand that. Right now it is a passive wrath. There, has been, there have been times in the past when God has poured out that wrath. He poured it out on Sodom and Gomorrah for their abomination of homosexuality before Almighty God. And we're going to see this downward spiral here in America, folks. We've got people in government today who are pushing the culture of death. It's okay to murder a baby after that baby's come out of the womb. That's directly contrary to God and His Word, and yet we're seeing us take that downward spiral. The wrath of God has settled and is on every man and woman, boy and girl, apart from Jesus Christ. Sometimes that wrath is manifested like He did in Sodom and Gomorrah. Sometimes God would manifest it in other ways, but we're always under that wrath of God. Always. And one day, when God takes the church out, that wrath will literally be poured out on this world. So John is very clear, if you refuse to accept the Son, you're under the wrath of Almighty God. Boy. And Paul is clearly demonstrating to us that that wrath is presently abiding over the whole human race. Now notice how specific he gets. The wrath of God is revealed and two things in particular he points out. 
the wrath of God is revealed against ungodliness. Now, when you say, and we'll use that term today, that guy or that woman or that young person, are, is, they're ungodly. What do you mean by that? Usually when we say they're ungodly, we're thinking about moral, physical action. But that's not the primary meaning of this word. It's a word that describes someone who does not live in fear of God. They have no reverence for God. None whatsoever. Some don't even want to admit He exists. And even if they admit He exists, they live as if He did not exist. In 2 Timothy 3.16, uh, 2.16, this is what Paul wrote to a young preacher. Avoid irreverent babble. And there's a lot of irreverent babble going on in our culture today. For it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And that word irreverent here means it is empty, it is void, it is useless. In the ancient culture in which the scriptures were written, useless talking was believed to be caused by a sickness of the soul that demonstrated itself either in quantity or the quality of speech. Do you ever just listen to some people talk? You go through Walmart and all you hear are cursing. And usually the cursing is aimed at children. That, that's become commonplace in our culture. This is babbling. It's irreverence toward God. It's a, and it's manifested either in the quantity or the quality of your speech. Boy, ungodliness. There's no reverence toward God. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. That's Jesus. John said, we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. That grace and truth are fully and finally revealed in the person, Jesus Christ, who is the center and the content of the gospel, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion. Boy. You live that way? No reverence for God? Whatever word you think that would mean. No, we do live that way. That's where we are in America today. He's revealed it against all ungodliness. Now watch this. And against all unrighteousness. What is the theme of the gospel of, of Luke? Uh, excuse me, Rome, uh, the book of Romans? The righteousness of God. And that word righteous at its very basic meaning is a standard. God has given us a standard to live by. You go to work and you have rules and regulations. They've given you those rules and regulations. If you break them, then you're subject to being terminated. God has given us the rule book. And unrighteousness means I don't live by this rule book. I violate what He says in it. Oh, that's being unrighteous. Oh, I have violated God's divine standard. Both the written word and we don't measure up to the holiness and perfection of Jesus Christ. Over in Luke 18, this word is used to describe the unrighteous life of a judge. Unrighteous judge. Injustice and immorality and heart and life. No moral standing. How many times are you... Uh, well... How much lately have you seen that coming out of the mouths of judges today, folks? I, it grieves me because of my legal... <laughs> no, I, they're legislating, legislating from the bench. That's not what they're supposed to do. Unrighteousness. And we're in a death spiral. 
over and over again. And Paul is saying to you and me, the wrath of God is right now revealed against all ungodliness, wickedness, unrighteousness. Oh, as one writes, lack of respect for God leads to a lack of justice for people. History demonstrates that nations that forsake God lose their concerns for the rights of the individual. To forsake God is to forsake His creatures. As a national policy, now listen to this one very carefully, folks. As a national policy, atheism grounds its people under the collective heel of what is best for society. Oh, I know what's best for you. You don't. Government. A godless government. And it will grind the people under its heel. Under the guise, I know what's best for you. But you don't have the freedom to speak out anymore. You don't have the freedom to believe and you think that's just... Oh no. You hear it every day on the news. It's just getting a little bit a little bit more and more and more. Now watch what happens. God's wrath has been revealed. Look what these people do. The ungodly, the unrighteous. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They don't know God. They don't honor God. They don't recognize God. They don't reverence God. They don't fear God. And by their unrighteousness and their ungodliness, Paul said, they are suppressing the truth. That word suppress means to hold, hold down. You ever been to the beach or you've been in a swimming pool and you have a big beach ball and you try to push that ball down into the water so you can get up on top of it, and what happens? Zoom! Right back up. But you keep pushing it down and pushing it down, but it won't stay that way. And this is what Paul is talking about. There are people in our culture today that are pushing down the truth. They don't want the truth proclaimed. They suppress that truth. Boy. And he's going to go on to tell us men know the truth. But they don't want it proclaimed. They don't want it working in their own lives. And so they will suppress it so they can live their own lives by their own agendas. Oh. As one writer put it, truth cannot be changed, but it can be held down or stifled. Oh. So we have that boldness coming out today from those who profess no God, who are pushing Christians to the fringe. And make no mistake about it, folks, they want to silence our voices. They don't want us to be heard. And they're already giving us the terms of surrender. You shut up or you'll face the consequences. You're not free to believe anymore. Only what I tell you to believe. So they're, they're suppressing the truth. I'm so thankful they can't hold that truth down. It's impossible to do that. Now watch what he said. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. God made it evident to them. J just watch the downward spiral of these people, folks. And I pray that you're not on this downward trend this morning. You hear the truth, but you don't have that reverence toward God. You're not falling according to His standard. And Paul said, when you live that way, you refuse to believe. You try to hold that down. But He has revealed, and this is, this is the sovereign Creator God we're talking about. He has revealed to all of humanity 
His power and His nature. And when people refuse to believe that, they plunge themselves into greater, deeper darkness. And they become crystallized in their rejection and their behavior. As one commentator put it, to turn willfully against God is to move from light into darkness. The blindness that follows if self-imposed. Utter rejection of God. They are expressing contempt for God's character and it is perpetuated by those who live in unrighteousness. Huh? I hope that doesn't describe you this morning. And we can take that so lightly. You don't have to go out there and stand in the street and shake your fist in the face of God. We do that every day when we refuse to acknowledge the truth. And we don't recognize that He is the Sovereign Lord, Creator, Redeemer of my life. No. Now, look at verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. This, this is why the judgment and the wrath of God one day is going to come in full force. It is revealed because. This is a conjunction in the Greek reason for everything he's just said. God has made it evident to everyone. He has provided sufficient evidence of himself. He's made it clear. He's manifested that truth. It's observable. How has he done that? Two ways, Paul said. He did this in nature. You can't look at this universe and not understand there had to be a designer. There had to be a creator. This didn't just ooze out of the slime. No. It's not evolution. When God created Adam and Eve, He created them complete. They didn't evolve. He's made it known in nature. There is sufficient evidence. The theologians call this natural revelation. Read the 19th Psalm. Paul talks about that. In creation, you can look and know there had to be a creator. And everything down here had to be the work of a divine creator. And on that down, downward spiral, you know what we've allowed to happen. Our schools teach evolution. You're not free to teach creationism under the threat of being fired or terminated? Wait a minute. Nothing plus chance equals everything? No. And yet the children are inundated with that. They are indoctrinated with that. Hmm. We don't even know how to confront that. You know, our universities and colleges have just become incubators for all of this. I saw. And we're not doing a very good job of training the young people in our churches. So when they go out, if they choose to go out to a certain place, that warning light doesn't go off because they're in sin. They don't know the truth. Paul said, I've revealed myself in nature. Therefore, you are without excuse. There has to be a creator. Isn't it amazing that some of the most brilliant scientists in the world today who will teach evolution will be quick to tell you, we know that this is not fact. It is not fact. We have to accept that and teach it that way. Why? Because we refuse to acknowledge a one true God. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? Paul said God's revealed himself in nature. He's revealed himself. It's evident within everybody. Hmm. Boy. So let me tell you what that means, folks. That means the person that has never heard about the gospel, and you can debate this all you want, but the person who's never heard the gospel 
has a witness within him or herself. And they will stand before God without excuse. Now, there are degrees of punishment in hell, and I wouldn't take that as a sow for what way you're living. I, it, the least degree of hell would be worse. <laughs> oh. Man is without excuse. God has made it evident within them. So that means he's not only revealed himself in nature, he does that in our conscience. We have a conscience. We don't always understand how that works. But we do have a conscience. I was walking along the other day on one of the streets where there are nice, big, expensive houses. And I passed a certain driveway and I looked down and there was a $5 bill lying on the ground in that driveway. And I just stopped, picked it up. And I started on down the rest of that street and the Holy Spirit just began to convict me. Wait a minute. Nope. You don't need to do that. I couldn't find anybody to see if they knew about that. So I went to the end of the street, turned around, came back. When I got to that driveway, I just laid it right back down. And, and instantly that conscience <laughs> no longer was giving me fits. Oh, preacher. Yeah. God's built that into us, folks. And this is why his wrath abides on us. I don't have time to finish all of this. I... Listen to what he's saying. For since the creation of the world, certain invisible attributes of God have been clearly perceived. And that means in your mind with understanding. You see these things in that which has been made. And he mentions two of those attributes and I will stop. Eternal power. God just spoke this world into existence. There was nothing and he spoke it into existence. And not only did he speak, speak it into existence, he holds it together by the word of his power. And secondly, by his divine nature, his attributes, his faithfulness, his grace, his compassion, his mercy. God causes the rain to fall on the evil as well as he does the righteous. That's his, that's his compassion, his mercy. Boy. And Paul said all of this is clearly seen and understood. So you are without excuse. This is legal language and I'll leave you. The, remember we're in the courtroom. And if you wanted to state it in judicial language, from a legal standpoint, the people have been stripped of any defense. None whatsoever. And God's self-revelation of Himself in nature makes all of humanity responsible. All and again, this ought to settle the age-old question about people who've never heard the gospel. Who've never heard the gospel. If people respond, you can be assured God will make a way for them to know more and more of the truth. More and more of the truth. Ah. So those who do not believe are absolutely without excuse. So I want you to understand this morning, we're fixing to get out, get down to the to God letting go of this rope. He's holding on, but he'll let go of that rope. And you'll begin that slide in a more rapid descent than you even imagine. Paganism dominates our culture today. That's not a step up, upward in human evolution. It's a declension. We're going down. Human history began with man knowing God, not worshiping beasts and idols. Oh. 
we'll get what we ask for. I love what C.S. Lewis had said, and I'll leave this with you. The lost enjoy forever the terrible freedom they have demanded and are therefore self-enslaved. You want that freedom? I'll let go of the rope. And we'll see that in those 24, 26, 20. God gave them over, gave them over, gave them over to what they wanted. His wrath abides on everyone. If you're here this morning and you've never transferred your trust to a living, resurrected Christ, you're under the wrath and condemnation of God. He's made it possible for you to step out of that into light, into righteousness through faith in the Lord Jesus. If you've never done that, I challenge you, I encourage you and urge you to do that today. Whether you're watching us online or whether you're here in the auditorium, I invite you to pray this prayer with me as I do every week. Dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I invite Jesus Christ into my life. I accept him and I receive him as my Lord and my Savior. David's going to lead us in the hymn of commitment. If you prayed that prayer, maybe here you need to come forward or online. Again, we would just be thrilled for you to acknowledge that and let us know that you have prayed that prayer. As Debbie leads us in there. Well, we'll continue our study of Daniel chapter 9 as we approach this vision that God gave to Daniel. This is the pinnacle of the prophecy and probably the whole Bible, the vision of the 70 weeks of years. An exact, precise timetable of what's going to happen. And we'll take that up again tonight. Pray for Awana this uh, Wednesday night as continue to share with the children. And we're so thrilled to have Josh and Lorraine and that they brought a whole church in with the pages. <laughs> yeah, since like we're we're glad to have you back with us, Josh and Lorraine and the family. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Thank you, Father, for the truth of your word. I ask you to honor it in our hearts because we've heard you today. You promised that it will not come back void and we stand on that truth. Bring us back together as we worship around your word tonight. As we hear you speak through your prophet Daniel. We love you and honor you and praise you in the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen.